Open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, we'll pick it up again in verse 7 and following. And let's remember as we read that this is God's word. God's word to us. He is speaking to us. What we are about to read is more important than anything else that I will say this morning. It is the foundation of anything we should hear this morning. This is God's word. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, That comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Perhaps you've heard a relatively famous quote by the author C.S. Lewis. He says this in his inimitable style. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. For Paul, as with many people, his mud pies were not necessarily carnal delights, as Lewis describes here. They were not necessarily fleshly pursuits, pleasures of this world. For Paul, his mud pies were religious. His mud pies were religious accomplishments and righteousness, that he was satisfied with all that he had done in his mind to serve his God, to follow the Old Testament law, to be a a worthy, more than worthy, religious zealot. In Paul's mind, those were satisfying to him. They were impressive. He gleefully ran out the door each day to play in his mud pies. And then he met the Lord Jesus Christ. And in a moment, he realized how filthy, how worthless his religious mud pies had been. We find Paul in this chapter pulling his dear friends from Philippi with him metaphorically out to the sea and forcing them to fix their eyes on its beauty as wave after wave crashes to the shore and to examine the scope of the shoreline and the refreshing breeze and the smells and the sounds and the distance and the depth and to realize that the glory of Jesus Christ is worth losing everything else, especially those mud pies you've been playing in. The glory of Jesus Christ is worth more than anything. He is like the sea, vast and glorious and majestic and refreshing and better than anything else and worth losing everything else to enjoy. 
So he brings them to the sea to see Jesus Christ and invites them to join him there. Gazing and loving that glory and renouncing anything that would distract him from it. I think he would invite us to do the same thing this morning. I'm going to break this section into three points this morning. The loss that makes him glad, the gift he never had, and the goal he wants more than anything. Those are my three points. The loss that makes him glad, the gift he never had, and the goal he wants more than anything. And the culminating point of this passage, Paul's goal for us, is that Jesus Christ is worth more than everything. And he is worth losing everything else. Let's look down here at our Bibles, if you would. Beginning in chapter 3, verse 7. Bart picked this up a couple of weeks ago when he said, Whatever gain I had, Paul says, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And he emphasizes this point in verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish and be found in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. You notice the repetition of this word loss. Paul wants to emphasize that word over and over and over and compare it to Christ. Notice that's how these first few sentences work. There is the loss that Paul had, and then there's the sake of Christ. He counts everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. So he is comparing and contrasting the infinite sea-like worth of Christ with the mud pies of his own accomplishments. And in the context, the loss Paul is mostly referring to is those things that he wanted to boast in especially religious duties, those things that he wanted to be proud of. I don't think this is referring to suffering in the, in the main in a general sense or suffering when other people do things to you. That may include that at some level, but it primarily is focusing on those things that Paul would have counted as his advantage, as his boasting uh, you know, topics as the things that he was proud of, that he was excited about in himself, that he had accomplished. And he, he brings those right next to the glory of Jesus Christ. And he says, I count them now as loss, as, as worthless, less than worthless. They're a negative insofar as they distract me from Jesus. They're a negative in the sense that focusing on them keeps my gaze away from Jesus. One second even, focusing on a, a mud pie in a slum is, is not just neutral. It's negative if in that second you could be gazing at Christ. That's Paul's point. It's a negative to me. It's on the lost column because I don't, I don't want to focus on that at all compared to the greatness of Jesus Christ. The surpassing worth, he says. And you want to notice this phrase, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says in verse 7 that he has lost everything for the sake of Christ. He counted it as a loss. And he, he wants to count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then he uses the phrase, to gain Christ. The, the point here is, is not simply one of legal salvation, all right? Paul kind of transitions here, but he's been talking about the, the legal sense of being right with God, and he's going to include that, but it goes beyond that. Paul's vision of Christ is not merely as a Savior that gets you into heaven. It's not merely as an accountant that pays your debt that you never meet, Paul's vision of Christ is much more like that child that runs into the sea and enjoys the waves and the sights and the sounds. He wants people to know Christ. This is an important way to understand the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't just invite us to have a, a way of escape from God's wrath. It does that, but in order to get us to know the person of Jesus Christ. In that sense, Paul's plea here is a personal plea. It's an experiential plea. Notice he says, I don't count everything as a loss so that I can be saved or so that I can escape God's wrath or, or so that my guilt no longer plagues me. No, he says, because I want to know Christ. 
And the only way I can know him, he says, is if I count every other pursuit as worthless in comparison to him. So he holds out this this relational knowing, this personal knowing of Christ. Listen, there is no real gospel except the gospel that brings us into relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the only gospel that is the real gospel. There is no gospel that merely gets you out of hell and into heaven. The only gospel worth anything is the gospel that ushers you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's saying. I count everything as a loss, not merely to escape wrath, but to know Christ. And Paul has no exceptions to this. Everything, he said. And I count them as rubbish. I count them as rubbish. For Paul, even mentioning these things is embarrassing to him, you might say. To even mention what he has accomplished is embarrassing. You might imagine, to use a silly example, let's imagine somehow that you're having a conversation with a few friends and maybe some of your children and Michael Phelps, the Olympic gold medalist. And you're congratulating him on all of his accomplishments and his gold medals which hang surrounding his chest. And, and you're very impressed. And you say, what a, what a wonderful career you've had and what a great job. And then, to your great embarrassment, one of your children pipes up and says, You know, my dad, he swims some laps at the community pool. And he's very fast. And you think, (laughs) let's not talk about that right now. We'd really rather not discuss that. Daddy's swimming at the pool. We we don't want to, no thank you. That's not part of this conversation, right? Because it has no relevance. You don't even want to talk about that. It's embarrassing in the present company to talk about that accomplishment. What might have been impressive on the day off with your family is not impressive in this context. And Paul would even go further than that. He uses this word, I count them as rubbish. The translators struggle to to find the right way to describe this in English. Sometimes it's been translated dung, could be an accurate translation. Other times, refuse. Um, Neither of those is is particularly better. Actually, uh, Gordon Fee, the commentator, says this. If it is to be translated refuse, he says this. It is also well attested, this word, to denote refuse, especially of the kind that was thrown out for the dogs to forage through. A translation like filth perhaps captures both the ambiguity and vulgarity. In either case, it is hard to imagine in a more pejorative epithet than this one now hurled at what the Judaizers would promote as advantages. He thinks it's possible that Paul is connecting this word to the dogs that want to make these Philippians boast in their own righteousness. He's saying, let me tell you what I think about what they want to boast in. It's like what dogs would go after in the street. Paul sees them as strictly disadvantages, a total loss, indeed as foul-smelling street garbage fit only for dogs. Not much better than dung. So either way you translate it, the point Paul is making here is it's not just that I find it even embarrassing, it's that I find it repulsive, the idea that I would boast in those things. I find it offensive that I would want to brag in some accomplishment of mine, in the presence of this glorious Christ that I have come to know. It is repulsive to me, offensive, embarrassing, disgusting, boasting in my accomplishments is the last thing I would ever want to do. It is a loss. Paul says, that is how I view my prized religious possessions compared to Christ. Everything Paul had had been taken from him, his religious prestige, even his own sense of his religious prestige, he had cast aside as refuse for the dogs to rummage through in the street. Paul wants the Philippians to join him at this seaside and to cast away their mud pies in the slum 
and the refuse of their own accomplishments. And he wants us to do the same thing. He's trying to put forward his example yet again and say, come, come with me and cast aside the accomplishments that you would want to brag about, especially those religious accomplishments, and count them as I do, as rubbish, as, as refuse, worthless, because you are gazing at the glory of Jesus Christ. You are knowing him, and there's, there's no place to bring that in with you. Now, what things might we want to boast in or count to our advantage? This is where the rubber meets the road in the topic of legalism. It's being honest that we may not be like Paul in boasting that we learned in the temple of Jerusalem, but we have our own temples that we've set up that we boast about, don't we? Things that we're proud of, that we would be impressed by, that secretly we hope someone notices in a conversation. Perhaps you were basically a good kid when you were a kid. You never did drugs or drank at an early age. You never had overt rebellion. Are you impressed by that? A little bit. Perhaps you were a hard worker in school. You got good grades. You didn't waste time. You didn't skip class. Are we impressed by that a little bit? Maybe a lot. Maybe you were pure of body when you got married or so far in your single life. It's a good thing. Are you impressed by that? Maybe your marriage has lasted for years. Maybe you've never even considered divorce. Are you impressed by that? Maybe you pride yourself in being a calm and reasonable person, surrounded by emotional, hysterical people. Do you pride yourself in that a little bit? Is a little bit of dog-vomited refuse worth carrying around with you? even if it's just a little bit? A little bit of stuff on the shoe is just a little bit. Paul says, away from me. I want nothing to do with any boasting in what I've done. an old Puritan preacher who said, sometimes people congratulate or affirm me, I think the phrase is, and I am glad, and I despise the gladness that I feel. Search the corners of your heart. What are, what are the little bits that because maybe they're little, you've been hanging on to? Just a little bit of refuse isn't that bad, is it? According to Paul, you're trying to play with mud pies. Come to the sea. To the extent they are grounds for self-admiration, Paul considers his list a loss. Not because they were all bad in themselves, but because one filthy puddle of a slum street might be nice compared to another one but they all seem worthless compared to the sea. And Paul is basking in the view of Christ. The waves of his power and the breeze of his glory is washing over him, and he counts all these former glories as less than worthless. And then he continues to make clear what kind of gain and loss he specifically has in mind. What has he seen in Christ? What are some of the things he's seen in Christ that make him so valuable? What what transaction has taken place that he has counted something as a loss and something else as a gain? Well, this moves to the second point, the gift that he never had. The gift that he never had. The loss that makes him glad is where he begins, and then the gift that he never had. He says at the second half of verse 9, Not having, I've come to Christ and be found in him, because this is the reality. Not having a righteousness, righteousness of my own that comes from the law, 
but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So he says, here's the condition I've realized. I don't actually have the righteousness I even thought I had. Here, here's what I've realized. This treasure of righteousness that I thought was so impressive, it actually wasn't worth anything. I thought it was amazing. I thought it was a, a hoarded up wealth of merit, but it actually proves to be nothing. I don't actually have it at all. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but instead, surprisingly, I do have a righteousness, but it comes from God and depends on faith in Christ. Let me use an illustration. Let's imagine that Paul is like a little child, and every day of his life, for most of his life, he's been placing gold coins in a big safe called righteousness. And he's very excited because he's been diligent. And he plants gold coin after gold coin after gold coin, day after day after day, sometimes two a day, day after day after day. He's planted in years and years and years of accumulating. And then he saw Jesus Christ and he rushes to his safe of gold coins and he opens it up and he looks at one. He realizes they, they were plastic play pirate gold coins all along. They are quite literally worthless worthless. I can't bring this to God to pay for the debts of my sin, to impress him. This is worthless. I can't take this to the bank to pay for my loan. This is worthless. I've been working all my life only to find out the very righteousness I thought I had. I don't have it all. And then he opens the door again and realizes, but suddenly I have a, a treasure of righteousness. It's overflowing. It's abundant. And I didn't put a single coin in. I just received it by faith. Faith is receiving. It is receiving without earning. It's receiving without meriting. He says, I, I placed faith in Jesus Christ, and suddenly I have a righteousness before God. Real gold, righteousness. Righteousness before God that I can't take out and I can't put in. It's just there for me. It is in my account, sealed certain, the amount infinite, the value beyond price. There is a righteousness that I have received by faith that is a gift. I didn't have it of my own. It was worthless, and now I have it, and I didn't earn it at all. So Paul says, which safe do you want? Which safe do you want to be impressed by? The safe full of gold plastic coins that are worthless or the safe that says gift by faith in Christ that is overflowing with righteousness from God? Not righteousness that you've done or accomplished or that you can remove. Righteousness that is credited to you because it is given as a gift in Christ. This is the gift that he never had. In the first place, he thought he had it, and then he found out he had nothing. Zero, not just less than he thought. Nothing. It was worthless. And now he has more than he could have imagined. Credited to him. Unchanged. Unremovable. Unshakable. The righteousness of God given by faith in Christ. Listen, if you are here and you are, you're not a Christian, you're, you're just here because you're curious or you know somebody. Listen, this is the glory of the good news of the gospel, that all of our good works are as nothing, Paul says. And Paul is in a position to know he's the expert on righteousness. There's never been a greater expert on the value of plastic coins than Paul. And he examines these plastic coins and he says, yeah, they won't buy you anything. They won't buy you anything. I mean, you can take them around and trade them and try to... They won't buy you anything. God is not impressed when you try to purchase payment for your sin with plastic pirate toy gold coins. I've sinned, but, but I have this gold coin of saying I'm sorry for my sin a lot. I, I've lusted, but I have the gold coin of trying harder the next week. I was angry at my children, but I was generous with them at Christmas. I sometimes do sinful things in secret, but I go to church regularly. 
Sometimes I'm selfish with my time, but I always work hard on my day off. I've never done the things my father did. I've never done what my neighbor did. I read my Bible more often than I used to. Gold coins. They're plastic. They're they're not worth anything as something to boast in. They're not nothing, but as something to boast in, they're worse than nothing because they deceive you into thinking that they're something. It's not that all that Paul did was worthless in every sense. God is using it and using it as part of his mission and part of his training and his learning and his background. It's not worthless in every sense, but as a basis of merit before God, It's worse than nothing because it deceives him into thinking that it's something. And our good works do the same thing. Listen, if if you're not a Christian, every good thing you've done, every bad thing you haven't done is a plastic coin placed in the plate of God's holiness and it is just that offensive. And what's more offensive is that God offers his own righteousness freely to those who would rather hold on to gold plastic coins. He says, come, come, I I will give you more righteousness than you can imagine. A credit of righteousness will be put in your account. It will never be taken from you. And here's the big, amazing, gracious deal. It is given freely by faith. You receive it. It cannot be taken from you. It is the righteousness granted to you because you have seen the glory of Jesus Christ by faith. This is the gospel. And it is this kind of insidious legalism that eats out the heart and joy and glory of our faith. It creeps in and says, well, yeah, but surely now, now my plastic coins are better than they used to be. They are fancier. They are more impressive. They're good books, not lousy books. They're maturity instead of just well-wishing. They are a better marriage instead of just not a bad marriage. They are better gold coins. And even the Christian slips back into a gold coin mentality with God. And Paul says, no, I, I, I don't count them even now as an apostle, as a person far more mature than anybody here. I, I count them as rubbish. I don't want them anywhere around me. The stink of boasting in myself is offensive to me, Paul says. And it should be offensive to us. Paul will not boast in anything he has done. I want to recommend a very small and incredibly valuable book to you. If you've never read Honey Out of the Rock by Thomas Wilcox, it's very old and very powerful. I would encourage you to take it in small doses, uh, but take it regularly. (laughs) It helps us see how determined we are to be impressed with our own maturity and righteousness before God. Let me just give you a few samples. He says, a word of advice to my own heart and yours. You are a religious person, and you partake of all the ordinances. You do well. They are glorious privileges. But if you have not the blood of Christ at the root of your religion, it will wither and prove, listen to this, but a painted pageantry to go to hell in. If that doesn't sober you, I don't know what will. A painted pageantry to go to hell in? How many people attend church and will find themselves ultimately under the wrath of God because they trusted in church and not in Christ? He says in a different location, consider the greatest sins may be hid under the greatest duties and the greatest terrors. See that the wound that sin has made in your soul be pure, perfectly cured by the blood of Christ, not skinned over with duties and humblings and enlargements. Apply what you will, 
beside the blood of Christ, it will poison the sore. You will find that sin was never mortified truly if you have not seen Christ bleeding for you upon the cross. Nothing can kill it but beholding Christ's righteousness. Listen to this one. Nature can afford no balsam fit for soul cure. Healing from duty and not from Christ, listen to this, is the most desperate disease. Poor, ragged nature, with all its highest improvements, can never spin a garment fine enough without spot to cover the soul's nakedness. Nothing can fit the soul for that use but Christ's perfect righteousness. Listen, in my own heart, this requires constant vigilance. I mean constant vigilance. If I am not addressing this to my heart on a regular basis, I am quickly hoarding up gold coins. And Wilcox says those gold coins will turn to poison in your soul. I mean, I have to be faithful. It requires grabbing a hold of my soul and declaring, I will not boast in what I am doing right now Praying, reading the Bible, being patient with my children. I will not boast in that. That is not gaining me merit before you. My merit is found in the name of Jesus and his righteousness alone. So when I have a a great week and I come bouncing in to sing to the Lord, I notice that my confidence and joy seems elevated probably because I am excited about how good my week was. And so I renounce, no, I am no more able to come near to you right now after a good week than I would be after a bad week. And when I come in dragging and thinking, what a terrible week, it was. I must have to work my way back into the favor of God. I say, no, I am just as able to come confidently and sing confidently before you this week as I would be on a week where things went better. I reject those moments of being impressed with myself, and I reject those moments of wishing I could be impressed with myself. We reject them all, and we preach the gospel. Faith in Christ, a righteousness from God that has nothing to do with even good works that we do. Because this righteousness is given to him in Christ, Paul counts Christ worth more than anything and worth losing everything. It has become for him a better place to be than anywhere else. That's his final point. The goal he wants more than anything. The loss that made him glad, the gift he never had, and the goal he wants more than anything. That, he says, I may know him. This is probably picking up from that previous phrase that I may gain Christ, counting them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Verse 10 picks that up, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That I may know him, he says. Paul goes back and forth in this passage from his vision of the future, seeing Christ by sight and his current inheritance of Christ by faith. He seems to go back and forth. Paul does that a lot. He's, he's, he's always talking about where he is right now in Christ by faith, but where he's going to be before Christ in the end. He, he kind of flows back and forth, probably because he believes that with the resurrection of Christ, the end times entered into the world, but they're not yet finalized because Christ hasn't returned. So he lives, as it were, with one foot in this age and one foot in the age to come. And he lives in this reality. So he, he says, I, I, I want to gain Christ. He's looking ahead to that moment, humanly speaking, where he will see him. I want to know Christ. He's pressing ahead to know Christ more and more. And probably these two phrases, the power of his resurrection and the sharing in his sufferings, define for Paul what it means to know Christ. So, so probably this isn't like three phrases, know Christ, know the power of resurrection, and know his suffering. It's probably more like, I want to know Christ. Here's what that means. I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to share in his sufferings. What it means to know Christ, Paul says, is to know the supernatural power that raised him from the dead, both in this life spiritually and in the time to come physically. 
and it's to share his sufferings. What it means to know Christ is to know and look forward to power and to embrace suffering in his footsteps. That's what it means. You can see how knowing Christ is different from all kinds of other religions. It's not just power, and it's not just suffering. It's power in suffering. That's what it means to know Christ. If you want to know him, you have to know him as the risen Lord who will empower you to overcome your sin and walk in this world until you see him face to face. But you will also know the suffering that he endured because you are united to him. And as Jesus himself said, if the master suffered, the servants will suffer as well. So to know Christ is to embrace these two realities. It's to say, I want to know the supernatural power of God in my life, overcoming sin and enduring trials. And I also want to embrace that suffering that comes about because I am united to Christ. Probably Paul's not talking about every kind of suffering here. He deals with that elsewhere. He's probably talking about that kind of suffering that is specifically like Christ in that it is following God and causing you suffering because you are following God. Paul says, I love Christ so much, I want to know that. I'd rather have suffering with Christ than ease without him. I'd rather have the power of Christ than live a life that only requires me to trust in my own strength. I'd rather have suffering with Christ and be forced to rely on the power of God than no suffering and rely on my own strength. I'd rather look forward to resurrection than boast in my everyday life. I'd rather have Christ and his resurrection and his suffering than have anything else and I'd lose everything else to get it. Paul is like a a student of some ancient hero. He must travel to that hero's homeland and walk the streets that he walked and see the hills and the lakes and feel what it is to be where he was. For Paul, that location is suffering in the service of God. Because Christ suffered for Paul, Paul wants to suffer for Christ. And that is how much he values him. So much so that he says, I want to become like him in his death. Look at that phrase. This is Paul's way of saying what Jesus said. If anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross. And nobody's suffering for Jesus is the same as Jesus suffering for them. Jesus' suffering paid for our sins. Our suffering expresses our allegiance to him when we do it for his namesake. But Paul says there is a sense in which we are conformed to his death on the cross because we gladly offer ourselves as a sacrifice for the glory of God. Our lives are conformed to his life on the cross, saying, your will be done. And so we conform ourselves to that rather than clinging to comfort. He says, I love Christ so much. He is worth so much to me that even Christ on the cross is something I am gladly willing to embrace if in that moment I can know him more deeply. Gordon Fee says the Christian life is cruciform. That means cross-shaped in character. God's people, even as they live presently through the power made available through Christ's resurrection, are as their Lord forever marked by the cross. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to share his sufferings. Whatever I have to do, if I have to proclaim Christ and receive the scorn of this world, if I have to proclaim his his glory and his word and his authority and his plan, I, I want to do that even if that means my life starts to look like his and is shaped by the suffering of this world. Even if I have to renounce my own strength and live in a place that reveals my weakness, I will gladly do that if in that I can know him. Paul is not concerned about the easy life or the complacent life, but the life of knowing Christ Jesus. In addition to his righteousness, Paul counts his comfort as a mud pie to be treated with disdain compared to walking with Christ. In addition to his righteousness, Paul counts his comfort as a mud pie to be treated with disdain in comparison with walking with Christ. And we must do the same. I don't know what kind of suffering God has in store for each one of you. I was just talking to my boys about this. Look, we we don't know what kind of path God has for us. 
Some of us might be taken to the Lord more quickly. Some of us might have to travel more slowly along the pilgrim's road. We don't know what timing God has for us. Some of us might have to suffer physically for our faith. Some of us might have to suffer financially for our faith. Some of us, maybe it's relationally for our faith. We, we, we don't know. We, we don't want to envy or prefer someone else's walk. We know that we are willing to take whatever cross he gives us. We know we are willing. We say, Lord, what cross do you have for me? I will walk with you. And I will call out for the power of your resurrection to sustain me so that I can be conformed to you even in your death. May the will of the Lord be done in me, he says. For Paul, Jesus Christ is worth more than anything and worth losing everything else. John Owen says, On Christ's glory... I would fix my thoughts and desires, and the more I see of the glory of Christ, the more the painted beauties of this world will wither in my eyes, and I will be more and more crucified to this world. That by any means possible, Paul says, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is not Paul expressing wishful thinking. Well, I, I hope if I cling to Christ, at the end he'll save me. No, this is Paul saying there is only one way possible to attain the resurrection from the dead, and I want him. I want him. He is everything. And those sins that cling so closely and those gold coins that want to weigh my soul down, I will cast them aside because I want him. And you should want him too. Because Paul says there is only one way by which we can receive the resurrection from the dead. There is only one way, and that is receiving Christ by faith and clinging to him in life and rejecting our own righteousness and our own comfort in order to conform to him. That is the way by which the followers of Christ will one day see him face to face. Church, Christ is better than everything. He's better than that show we want to watch too much. He's better than our job if it costs us our convictions. He's better than our convenience. He's better than being respected by people. He's better than taking pride in what you've done. He's better than always being in a comfortable location in this world. He's, he's better than never having to move for the advance of the gospel. He's, he's better than never having to take a pay cut for the advance of the gospel. He's, he's better than never having to deal with conflict because you love your brothers and sisters in Christ for the sake of the gospel. He's better than leaving a, a difficult marriage because it's hard. He's better than all of those things. He's better than the supposed freedom of this world. He's better than finding your identity in a socially constructed evaluation of yourself. He's, he's better than physical pleasures. He is better. Paul says, come with me. Come with me, Philippians. Come with me. Leave the dogs and their vomity nastiness in that street and come with me and stare at this sea called Jesus Christ. Come with me. Spend your life here. And guess what? You don't ever have to go home. You can live here. You can live here where you work, when you're in the middle of a conflict, when you're in the middle of suffering, when you're in trial, when you lose painful things. 
You can live right here. You can live here from one email to the next on your way to the boss's meeting. You can live right here when you're doing your chores, when you're caring for your children, when they've made a mess for the 900th time. You can live right here when your parents go home to be with the Lord and you're crushed by the news that a friend has walked away from the faith. You can live right here. You can live right here on this seat staring at me. You can live right here forever. Sometimes right here will be incredibly painful. Sometimes you'll feel your weakness and you'll need my power. But you can live right here. You can live right here with me when you move to go on a new church plant. You can live right here with me when you reach out to evangelize a neighbor. You can live right here with me when someone screams at you on Facebook or in real life. You can live right here with me if society crumbles around here. You can live right here with me. Every moment of every day, you never have to leave. And one day, one day, the sun will rise and that vision of faith will become sight and as great as the ocean is now wait till you see him then let's pray Lord Jesus show us your glory Oh, we all have our own mud pies, Lord. Every one of us. Show us your glory. In the devotional moments and the practical moments, the relational moments and the suffering moments, show us your glory. Colossians chapter 1 says that Christ is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. It says he is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Let's behold him.